Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Significance Lecture uh, at RSS Conference. I'm Brian Tarran. I'm the editor of Significance magazine, and I want to thank you all for joining us, uh, whether that's live here in Manchester or uh, on the live stream online. It's my great pleasure today to introduce our two speakers, uh, Tom and David Chivers. Tom is the science editor at Unheard, as well as a science writer and author. He has twice been awarded a Royal Statistical Society Statistical Excellence in Journalism Prize in 2018 and 2020, and he was highly commended for the same prize in 2017. Uh, Tom worked for uh, seven years at The Telegraph and three years at BuzzFeed before going freelance in 2018. And uh, apparently he was once described by Sir Terry Pratchett, one of my favorite authors, as far too nice to be a journalist, which is very dispiriting for the rest of us. Um, so David uh, is an assistant professor of economics at Durham University, and before this he was a lecturer at the University of Oxford and completed his PhD from the University of Manchester. Uh, he has published in academic journals such as the Review of Economic Dynamics, Economic Theory, and the Journal of Economic Behaviour and Organisation. His research interests involve topics relating to inequality, growth, and development. Now, Dave and Tom, uh, they recently co-authored a new book called How to Read Numbers, A Guide to Statistics in the News and Knowing When to Trust Them. And their talk today will explore why the media is often so bad at statistics and what, if anything, can be done about it. Uh, so please give a warm welcome to Tom and David. Oh, thank you so much for inviting us. What an honour, what an honour. So yes, um, yeah, so the reason I'm standing in front of you today is, well, I wrote a book, as you can see, with my cousin Tom, and I'm an economist, I deal with stats every day, and Tom, Brian, is it right, did you win two uh, awards, Tom, is it right? Two and a half. Two RSS awards, he's an award-winning journalist, sorry, he doesn't really <laughs> mention it very often. Um, basically, yes, so we wrote this book, and uh, I can understand why you'd think we're going to just be blaming journalists, but sadly, we can't. There are problems upstream of journalism, and that's what I'm going to talk about, and I will do that now. So, basically, if there were no issues with journalism, or if with statistics in society, they wouldn't really have a problem. I wouldn't be speaking to you today, because we just know that it was wrong. Journalists wouldn't make these mistakes, we would be able to spot them. So if we had a better level of statistical literacy in society, then everything would be fine. Um, and I think the best way to sort of, sort of look at this is to compare it with actual literacy. So this is a quote from the Daily Telegraph, a direct quote in 2018. I don't think Tom was working there, so it wasn't his fault. But if we were to read it, children born to older men had 18% higher odds of having seizures compared with youngster with fathers aged 25 to 34 years. I mean, you can, I think most people could see the sentence is garbled. It doesn't make sense. There's some grammatical error here. And I think, okay, maybe people wouldn't be able to see where the error was, but I think um, they, would, they would know there's an error, but actually if we were to sort of fix the error compared with youngsters with fathers aged 25 to 34 years, you'd be able to understand what's going on. It makes grammatical sense. Now, sitting in a room full of statisticians, we would be looking at this and thinking, hmm, all right? We would obviously want to see it in absolute risk terms. So, you know, if we did that, it's actually younger fathers to have a 24 in 100,000 risk of giving birth to children with seizures, raising to 28 in 100,000. So that 4 in 100,000 increase is where the 18% comes from. Now, I think there's a moral problem here. Because can you imagine somebody reading this in the news and seeing that may actually, be, as an older father, you know, like Tom, for example, um, may be thinking, I might not want to have kids anymore because of this. And this is a real effect that happens. I've, 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 anecdotally, I've, I've heard people doing these things when they've read the news and actually done it themselves and sort of said, oh, this is a risk, I'm not doing that or whatever. And that's a huge problem because if you're able to read statistics like you're able to read and understand grammar, then you'd be able to have a better understanding of society and the way we live. So how can we fix this? How can we fix this issue? Well, we could say, as the Royal Statistical Society, we need more stats in schools. But the problem with this argument, it's a bit like the Royal Shakespeare Society saying, we need more Shakespeare in schools. Like, every time a profession says, you know, we need more X in schools, it just falls on deaf ears. So what can we do? Well, I think, we, I think it's true. We do need to teach statistics more in schools, in science, not just in maths. How do we do that? And I think there's a sort of strong argument we need to make. And that is, why do we think literacy is important anyway? That seems like a bizarre argument. Why, do, why is literacy important? Of course it's important. 
But it's kind of weird. Why is literacy so important? And I think, I mean, obviously there's a learning perspective, but if you imagine the 19th century when literacy rates were increasing in the UK, part of the reason was this expanding um, electorate. I think we think it's important for democracy. Can we really say we're a democratic country if we can't hold our governments to account? We can't read and understand what's going on in the news. But now, in the 21st century, we have so much news and information from data, from governments, sorry, governments and from the news, giving us data, giving us statistics. But we can't read them as a society. We can't read them as well as a written word. So I think it's part of literacy itself is statistical literacy. It's important from a democratic perspective. So I think we can do this. We can argue for more education stats in school from this perspective. Now, what's the other problem of where stats go wrong in the media other than journalists? Unfortunately, we're all sitting here as academics. It's us. We are part of the problem because if we do a bad study, then obviously that study is going to get up, get into the news, and it's going to be broadcast to everywhere. And what is the biggest problem, I think, in statistics? Um, it is this. Now, everybody sitting here probably has a good understanding of this subject, or this idea, because you're statisticians. But if you're somebody who's not a statistician, or you're watching this on YouTube later or something, you'll be thinking, what on earth is this? But it's such an important concept. This, to me, is like, amazingly important, from physics to biology to psychology to economics. Any time of sort of, to me, this is science. This is what we do when we think of, when we think of science. It is so poorly understood, um, people are outside of basically science or uh, statistics don't really understand this, and even the academics themselves aren't great. And why is that? That's because, sadly, statistical significance is associated with this. Now, some people may have seen this uh, if they don't know what statistical significance is. They might have seen science memes about this. Tom, I'm pretty sure, was this the first time when you saw statistical significance? Is this how you first saw it? Probably, yeah. Yeah. So most people would have seen this and associated it with it. Now, I've seen definitions of statistical significance in biology textbooks that just talk about statistical significance with p-values. That's it. Nothing else. Because this is, this is bizarre. And it's a huge problem. And why is it a huge problem? Because we're forgetting what statistical significance is about. And it's about this. And we all know this as statisticians, but I'm not 100% sure everyone knows it or at least remembers it when they're doing statistical testing. So let's say what the problem is. Okay, so let's say we wanted to find out whether lit-up screens, reading lit-up screens before bed causes you to sleep badly. You know, like scrolling through your iPhone before bed potentially has an idea that you won't sleep very well. It sounds like an interesting hypothesis. What would we do? Well, of course, we'd have what we would call a null hypothesis, where there's, some, there's like no association between reading on lit-up screens that we're trying to test, um, reading on lit-up screens before bed and sleep that we're trying to test. And that is obviously our innocent until proven guilty state of the world. And then we have an alternative. So there's some association between reading lit um, on lit-up screens before bed and sleep. So let's say we do this test. Let's say we take 100 people, or say maybe a bigger sample size or something, we'll take 1,000 people, why not? Give half of them um, a paperback book uh, and half of them sort of a lit-up e-reader type thing. And then let's say we see some negative correlation in our data. And so what happens? So what, obviously what we're doing in this point, and I know you might, I sound strange why I'm explaining statistical significance to a statistics audience, but just bear with me. Um, but what we're actually doing here is we're saying, okay, well, how likely it is under this model of the world, under these assumptions, would we see this result under the null hypothesis if there was no association? And that's where you get this p equals less than 0 0.05 idea because we're saying we're setting this arbitrary measure of 5% of the time. We want a result as extreme, um, lower than this less than 5% of the time. And that's what we would say is statistically significant. If it was higher, it's statistically insignificant. But this is what people forget. They are forgetting that it could be the case that the null is still true. And what happens in practice? And this is what happens in practice once you've learned this and forgot all about this. You are a new researcher, and you get the data, and you stick it in R or some other statistics software, and you're plugging away, and you see your results from your sleep study are statistically insignificant. You go, oh, no, what am I going to do? Because statistical significance is treasure. 
And what do you do when you're looking for treasure? You hunt for treasure. So you run the thing again, and you maybe change a parameter, or you add another control variable. Sadly, still, p is greater than 0 0.05. We're not statistically significant. So you keep running again, keep running again, and huzzah, you've got statistical significance. You publish your piece of work. It gets in the paper. Tom writes about it, and everyone thinks it's great. But you've forgotten the story. You've forgotten what you were doing, because it doesn't mean it's definitely true. And the fact that you keep doing this means the more likely it is what you've found is this fluke. Is this just random amazement that you're still under the, no, the null hypothesis? And that's a difficult concept to understand, but it's an important one. Now, that's people acting you know, in out of ignorance or they're forgetting. But we know people do this maliciously. Why? Because people have admitted it. They, it's called p-hacking. You can continually do this over and over again until you find the statistically significant result. But why on earth would people do this? I mean, it's a reasonable question. Surely we're all scientists. Well, because we're incentivized to do it. It's our job to publish in journals. And if you don't publish statistically significant results, then you're not going to get a career. And we, as academics, have incentivized us some way. Yes, there's a big system, but it's a huge problem and everybody here knows about it. And, there's, and that's, I think, it's a huge problem of statistical significance, and that's even before you get to the media. So let's see what happens when journalists get involved. So, let's say you're a journalist, not like Tom, you know, but a normal journalist, like not one who paints Warhammer and teaches himself statistics, <laughs> someone who doesn't do that. But let's say you're a journalist and you read this. Okay, so this is the abstract of the academic paper. Reading lit-up screens before bed has statistically significant negative effects on sleep. Okay, so what you're going to write as a headline, I'd write something like this. <laughs> okay, so is this the journalist's fault? Well, you can say it's a little bit sensationalist. You can see what they've done here. Reading on a lit-up screen before bed means there's a lack of, causes lack of sleep. We kind of know lack of sleep is related to early death, ergo this headline. This is a natural headline, by the way, and it's a natural study that I'm talking about. Um, but what's happened here is in the weeds of the paper, um, maybe on page 47 or something, it's the actual effect size is this. You have to read for four hours, four hours of reading before bed. Obviously, I haven't got children. On lit-up screens, before, um, will decrease your overall sleep by 10 minutes. This is not a huge amount. It's not a huge amount at all, is it? I mean, it's a small effect size. Now, the journalists may not have access to that because of sort of, you know, the whole problem that we don't really let the public read our papers. Um, but it's a problem. So... I wouldn't necessarily blame the journalists for that, but there's another reason, and this reason is related to this. So I'm going to ask you this question quite quickly now, and you have to give me the answers that come into your head first. What's the difference between, or definition, of arachnophobia and hippophobia? If you said spiders and hippos, you're wrong. Spiders and horses. So let's see what you did there. So arachnid, arachnid we know it's a spider. We know phobia is fear. Hippos are short for hippopotamus, right? So you think fear of hippos. Why not? But unless you knew that fact, or you speak Greek, that's another alternative, then you wouldn't know that this is a fear of horses. It's what I would call a misleading word. A word we think we know what it means, but actually it's not. Now, I'm a journalist, and I come to this, uh, your abstract, and I see, what's the definition of statistical significance? What do you think that means? Well, if I said there was a significant birthday coming up, you probably think it's 21 or 30 or 40, or there's a hugely significant event. Something of, you know, it means something of grand importance, something big. You think it's something to do with effect size, right? You wouldn't think of four hours and reading and then 10 minutes of sleep. You think of something big, all right? Significance means something important, something amazing. Oh, how did that slide get in there? Not 100% sure, but as you can see, we're doing the significance lecture, and it's a play on words, and we understand that because we understand statistical significance, and we also understand the pun of significance. Uh, significance. I think we were saying significance actually came from signify. Is that right? From Fisher rather than um, anything to do with effect size. So Tom and my sort of radical idea, we're going to leave you one radical idea today, is we think we should simply rename statistical significance. We need to rebrand it. And there are many reasons why. Firstly, I think, how do we learn the name statistical significance? I learned it in my A-levels when I was doing a stats course. We just teach it. We say, look, it used to be called this, and now we call it something else. We thought of, I think, statistically detectable. Is that right? But yeah. 
again, I'm not sure about this because it gets away from the null hypothesis and all that sort of thing. But whatever we uh, talk about, and we can talk about that later in the Q&A. We want your feedback on this. Um, it's great because we can say, like, this is the reason why we want to rename it. Firstly, people thought it was to do with effect size. It isn't. Okay? Secondly, people forget that it's about hypothesis testing and all these other things. And we can talk about it because that's something that I feel is extremely important. Often when we teach statistics, we teach the theory of statistics rather than teaching what people do after they've left the classroom, when they become researchers. And what they're going to do is they're going to you know, put their stuff into R. They're going to do it accidentally. And my students do this all the time whenever they get data. So we need to teach what actually happens, right? Not just the theory, but what people do. And I think by renaming it, by sort of rebranding it, we can highlight this issue rather than, if not, we're going to basically have to go around to everybody explaining what statistical significance is. It's hard. It's not easy. So I think it's a huge problem, but we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Anyway, I'm going to now introduce you to my uh, fantastic co-author and cousin, I'm sure you all know, Tom Chivers. Okay, so, why go? why numbers go wrong upstream of journalism. Um, and I think, I suppose, I'm going to talk about, I'm a journalist, so I'm going to talk about how they go wrong in journalism, more important, why they go wrong. Um, because I think most of us would agree that they do um, in fairly common situations. So, okay, here's the example I'm going to start with. And it was a horrible headline in, the, I think, the Sunday Times, about two or three years, early, beginning of 2019. And the story was that uh, the suicide rate among 15 to 19-year-olds didn't, in fact, double. It went up by... But can, am, I, am I all right if I point that up a bit more? No, that's fine. Yeah, so suicide rate went up among 15 to 19-year-olds by something like 70% between 2010 and 2018, which is obviously just a horrifying-sounding story. Um, but the trouble was... I mean, there's no real sort of really straight. There's no nice way of saying this. The story was complete nonsense. The, um, they had done the, they had done what I think of as the the uh, climate change deniers trick of t taking a cherry picked starting point. They'd chosen 2010 as their starting point because that was the lowest year on record for the uh, for suicide rates among the, among that age group. And then and so you could have picked literally any other year and shown a, shown a raise. Um, and as it happened, 2018 was a bit of a spike up. And uh, they'd also done a really sort of naked bit of subgroup analysis. They'd taken two, 15 to 19 year olds because that was where this was visible in, in all other age groups, especially including all other youthful age groups. Numbers had gone down over the last several decades. And because this was a small subset of 15, 19 year olds, and because mercifully suicides are really rare among that age group, it was really vulnerable to noise. We were talking about perhaps 100 a year, and so it's very small changes led to huge spiky changes in the graph. And so if you looked at the, the chart itself, it didn't, it didn't look at all like a trend going up. It looked like weird spikes all over the place. But because you could take this data set of suicides, look through it for, for correlations and, and, and mine noise, you could tell this terrifying story, which got a lot of attention. And that sounds pretty bad. And I wanted to know, so how does stuff like this happen? Because, believe it or not, I think journalists are basically decent people. All right? um, I can say this from some years of experience. All right? I've been working as a journalist for about 14 years now. Um, there's this sort of idea that we're all click-hungry bastards out to destroy careers. Um, and people like that do exist. But most journalists I know sort of view journalism as a public service. We, um, you know, on the whole, they are intelligent, educated, sort of uh, hardworking people who could probably earn more money in industries that weren't dying. And uh, they want to do good and they want to uncover corruption and they want to sort of tell truth and, uh, you know, campaign for good causes. So how do they end up writing things like that first story, which are borderline flatly untrue. Um, well, here's one problem. Is I think most journalists are not particularly good with numbers. Um, I have this uh, sort of sad story about, uh, sort of awkward story about that. But in about 2011, I worked in a newsroom 
And I don't know if any of you remember this, but there was this satellite. I think it was the Rosat satellite. It was a German satellite. And it was going to crash. It was, its orbit was degrading. And at some point, it was going to fall out of the sky and land somewhere. And because it's quite hard to precisely model uh, the inter interaction with the atmosphere, it wasn't exactly clear. You knew, what, knew the line it was going to land on, but they didn't know exactly where. And some, the number going around was that it was about a one in 2,000 chance that it would injure somebody. And a journalist in my newsroom managed to do that. I go, one in 2,000? Wow, that's more likely than being hit by a bus. And I thought, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. That doesn't sound right to me, because more people are hit by buses than are hit by satellites, broadly speaking. Um, so I tried to work out where that had gone wrong. And it turned out that they had... Um, They'd confused the chance of this satellite hitting somebody with the chance of a bus hitting you, and therefore were out by a factor of seven billion. Um, <laughs> which was, you know, like it's just, it, it, it's, it just, you know, didn't run that immediate sense check that you need to do in that sort of situation. But then on the other hand, uh, statistics are genuinely hard. I mean, Dave's just been talking about statistical significance and how many of the general public can accurately define that, or, you know, uh, many. So certainly a lot of psychology lecturers, for instance, get it flat wrong. A lot of textbooks, literal text, you know, scientific textbooks, get the definition wrong. And it's a bit hard to expect journalists to get it right when scientific textbooks get it wrong. And then other things like, you know, a lot of the ways that statistics can be confusing, things like Simpson's paradox or collider bias, these are confusing concepts. And it's not, it's asking a lot of journalists to get that right when, you know, they're just flat. Again, a lot of scientists will not understand it. But again, that can't be the whole problem. So this was a headline in the Daily Mail about three years ago. Uh, oh, it's, it's written down in front of me, isn't it? Of course. Uh, one glass of antioxidant red wine a day slashes men's risk of prostate cancer by more than 10 something. I can't remember if it was 10, presumably it's 10%. <laughs> anyway. Um, anyway, but same newspaper two years earlier. Even one glass of wine a day raises the risk of cancer. Alarming study reveals, et cetera, et cetera. Now, those two headlines are pretty much directly contradictory. I mean, they, they, they almost cannot both be true at the same time. Possibly you could thread the needle in some way. But they, you know, basically you can't have red wine raises your risk of cancer and red wine reduces your risk of cancer be true at the same time. They can't, so you don't have to have a maths PhD to work out that these two statements cannot be true at the same time. So... It can't just be that there's a sort of lack of numeracy. What is going on when journalists write these headlines that flatly contradict each other? And I think that is a lot to do with journalism's incentive structure. So journalism isn't... Journalism, in the end, is a business, right? We write, um, we write stories, and, we ha and people have to read them. People have to buy our newspapers, they have to watch our programs, they have to click on our website. Otherwise, it, um, you know, otherwise we don't make any money as a business. And, uh, and uh, the companies go out of business and uh, individual journalists get fired and we don't have... So that ends up with a lot of the same... ends up incentivizing a lot of the same problems as you see in scientific publishing, which Dave's been talking about earlier, which says is an incentive to... a sort of demand for novelty... You know, we need stories that tell us something new rather than, some, rather than sort of simply trotting out the thing that is true. I mean, in the red wine example, for instance, the new study that comes out saying red wine slightly causes cancer or prevents cancer is the new thing, whereas the existing body of evidence of many, many thousands of studies, which all show roughly, roughly the same thing, slight increase in risk each time, that's old and is not interesting and you can't shock, you can't make, have a shocking new headline about, the, you know, so, so, that, so there's a demand for novelty, there's demand for positive results, there's demand for certainty. Um, and there's also a demand for, well, it incentivizes you to give numbers that shock or that, that uh, support, a, uh, support a position rather than putting them into context. So, you know, giving the absolute risk rather than the relative risk, as Dave was talking about a minute ago, or um, uh, not giving the denominator on large numbers saying, you know, that 35 people die of whatever each year. Is that a big number? I don't know, you know? Um, and, uh, the, and, this, and this leads to journalism churning out a lot of things that are mis, you know, misleading at best. I also want, I want to defend journalism to an extent as well, though, because firstly, the industry, as I mentioned earlier, 
is dying quite badly. Um, and there are, and there are fewer journalists covering the same amount of news. And that means that I've, you know, I've, I've always been very lucky in my career and had plenty of time to write long stories that are thoughtful and had, you know, can, I can inv look into it a bit. But I've know a lot of science journalists who've had, who have to write five science stories a day, and you don't have time to do much more than read the press release in that case. And also, I think journalists are often accused of chasing clickbait or, you know, fighting culture war wars for, you know, it's, it's nonsense culture wars or just doing celebrity nonsense or sports nonsense. And it's, you know, where is that, where, why aren't you covering the famine in Yemen or why aren't you doing investigative journalism and uncovering the, um, you know, uncovering corruption in government or whatever? And the answer is we are and we do and no one reads it. Like this is just, it's just you know, this is such a famous thing that you do the um, you know our, our uh, will will send some string, stringer to Yemen for ages and then they'll they'll do loads of work and they'll uh, find, find horrible stories and then no one will read it but everyone will read the thing about Kim Kardashian and the stories about Kim Kardashian subsidise all the good public service work that everyone says they want but then no one reads um, and that's these are difficult big problems that journalism. You know that make it really hard to get good statistical coverage in journalism. These are, they're, firstly, they're difficult. Secondly, journalists are not always particularly good with numbers anyway. And thirdly, there's these massive incentive problems pushing us towards things that are more uh, exciting or and therefore often less true. So that, these are these are real problems, and they're quite deep-seated problems. And much as I would like to think that our book will solve them all. I think they probably won't. The book isn't probably going to get rid of the internet or make investigative journalism pay for itself. But we did think there is something we can do that would be quite useful and might make a difference, at least on the margins. Pretty much every journalistic publication has a house style. Um, many of them produce their own style guides, so like The Economist and The Telegraph and The Times and The Guardian. They all produce their own house style. Others use other ones. So a lot of American um, uh, publications use the AP style guide. A lot of British ones use the Economists, and they'll do things like you know they'll tell you. At first mention, you call someone John Smith. At second mention, you call them Mr. Smith. You know, or you call them Smith. You know, so, so do, what do you use the honorific? Do you not? And it makes the, the whole uh, publication sort of unified. It presents it, puts it forward as a uh, straightforward sort of unified uh, face, I suppose. Um, but it also helps the writer get things right that the readers care about. So The Telegraph, for instance, where I worked for a long time, um, it cared very, very deeply about getting the, uh, the names, the, the aristocracy correct. It was really hot on that. Like, if you want to know the difference between a Marchioness, a Marques, and a, and a Monsignor, then you go to the Telegraph style guide. Also on army ranks or anything like that. It would be very, very careful about this. Um, BuzzFeed, where I also worked, different approach. Um, but you, uh, so we're extremely careful about not 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 miswriting J Lo. I don't want to get that wrong. But um, but dial definitely hyphenated. Douchebag, one word, very important. Um, never worked at the Daily Star, but uh, that is they, their style guide was very very careful about not 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 hyphenating Bell End. That's just not something you do around there. Um, <laughs> But what's something about these style guides, they're, they are, you know, they're important and they're useful, but they don't tell you how to write numbers. They tell you, well, they do, they tell you to write numbers 1 to 10 out in words and higher numbers in, uh, in numerals, that sort of thing. They tell you how to present numbers, but they don't tell you how to present them as, uh, you know, to, how, to, how to make them clear, how to, make, how to try to avoid being misleading, how to give readers the tools to navigate the world, which is fundamentally what we're trying to do. We're trying to make the world explicable for readers so they can know true things as best we can. You know, big philosophical debate about what that means, but to some extent, pointing readers in the direction of understanding stuff. And we thought it would be really, really helpful to have a statistical style guide, uh, to have a statistical style guide. So literally a, a, a style guide that says, look, when you are writing about numbers, what can you do to avoid misleading your readers? And we think it's things like, um, well, I'll, Dave spoke a lot about giving absolute risk rather than just relative earlier. But, you know, the things like putting numbers into context. Uh, one number that we write about in the book was there were, I think, 361 deaths on London's roads. For, so cyclists were killed on London's roads between 1993 and 2017. And, you know, is that a lot? 
Is that a big number? And you, so you need some context, you need a denominator for that. So are there 4,000 cycle rides a day in London? Are there 40,000, are there 400,000? Because if there's 4,000, that means about one death in every 100,000 journeys. If there's 40,000, that means about one in every million. And if there's 400,000, that means one in every 10 million, which, you know, and, until you, if you want to make any sort of guess at how dangerous cycling in London is, and I do, because I do it an awful lot, then I need to know that denominator to make any sense of the number you've given me. The, the answer is the, la is the last of those. It's 400,000 cycle rides a day and about one death in every 10 million. And that number has gone down hugely in recent years. But, you know, the, the, point, the point is, I can't make any decision about the number you've given me unless you give me the context it comes in. Um, and things like, uh, we were talking about the red wine th thing earlier, making sure the study you're talking about is representative of the literature or, put, literature, or putting it into the context of the literature. Um, you know, uh, we also we talk a lot about in the book about you know, implying causation and making sure, because a lot of studies, a lot of the time we see a headline saying X causes Y when the study simply says X is correlated with Y. And really vitally we say, you should always give your sources, and if you get it a statistic wrong, you should just admit it and correct it if you can. And they, these are, you know, these, none of this is groundbreaking stuff. And we also don't think that it is the, um, it's like the be-all and end-all. We don't, we don't think this is the final word. We're not so naive as to think that um, uh, the BBC or someone will say, oh yes, this book by these two random dudes, they we're going to totally take on like all their, all their ideas. But we would love it if, if. Um, uh, publications started to use something like this, came up with their own. And they, it doesn't have to be these exact, these exact things. We were speaking to one uh, senior journalist who works a lot with data at the BBC, and he was saying, well, actually, we, we, he disagreed with us about um, giving sample sizes and uh, confidence intervals, because he felt like that's more than... The reader shouldn't be expected to justify, you know, to, to work out whether that's appropriate or not. The, you, you, as the expert, as a journalist, should give the context and make it clear how much you should trust this study in the text of the writing rather than saying, and this is the sample size, therefore don't trust it or whatever. That, that, and I, that, that's a good point and we would love to know um, if other people agree with that. So, I mean, broadly speaking, in fact, we would love to hear your, view, your views on this. But we think that something like a statistical style guide would be really useful for journalists and would be a sort of starting point for improving the way that we present numbers in the media. And in conclusion, um, buy our book. There we go. Cheers. Okay, excellent. Well, oh, of course, yeah. So we've got time for questions now. Uh, there is a speaker at the back of the uh, uh, microphone, sorry, uh, about halfway up the hall. If you could sp uh, speak there when you're called to speak. Also, people on the live stream, if you'd like to ask questions, there's a chat. Um, and I'm, I'm, I've got this here, so I'll be reading them out for you. Um, Tom and Dave, are you ready to... Yeah. Take questions. I think we've got a hand up at the back of the hall there. I'll go for it. We should say no, no questions to Tom about Warhammer. Save those for lunch. <laughs> Sam Ellis, XMOD. It's not really a question in, 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 to start with. Could you speak up a little? Sorry. It's, it's, a, it's not really a question to start with. It's a comment. Okay. Oh, good. Back to your original the, your first few slides, and you said everybody here understands. I'm not convinced everybody here does understand. If somebody comes up to you and says they're doing a significance test, do you know what they're actually doing? Yeah. Because Fisher never, never had an alternative hypothesis. And Fisher argued with you know, his p-values, spent his life arguing with Pearson and Neyman. And we're mixing up different philosophies, and I think the terminology needs to be tightened up. And I spoke to David Spiegelhalter in Cardiff, and he said, oh, it's not a problem, everybody understands. But if you went to Vic Barnett's book on comparative statistical inference, he has a whole chapter telling you, this is a significance test, this is a hypothesis test, this is, and they're different. So just as an experiment, how many people in the audience, put your hands up, if I said to you I'm doing a significance test, how many th people think I have an alternative hypothesis? And put some hands up. It's hard to tell how many hands are up from here. Yeah, but the, <laughs> see, but see what I mean? So I'm saying one thing and they're thinking I'm saying another. So I just think it's important to get the terminology right. And that's what I think RS, they have, I said to David Spiegel, I thought the RSS ought to do something about it. So, 
Yeah, no, I think I think thought. I completely agree with this um, in, in the sense that uh, it, this is the diff difficult thing. Because obviously you get lazy, and it's how it's how sort of science was re re um, evolved. In fact, we were talking exactly about the origins of significance testing. And I'm not an expert in that in myself. Um, but I do think it's something that we do so often, and obviously when we're thinking about significance tests, what we're really doing, it, in, or what I'm doing when I'm looking at data most of the time, is I am really just looking at an output table of p-values. That's what I do. I do, you know, that's my job as an economist. I'm looking at statistics. I don't think enough about that, but you're right. We need to be careful with uh, the methodology, and I think part of this debate that we're trying to have about why we think we need to rename statistical significance or thinking about that is to do, how can we, how can we, maybe make the concept uh, simpler or at least, at the very least, make it so that we don't misunderstand what we're doing. So, yeah, thank you very much for the comment. Okay, we're just going to take a, a, a comment from the chat quickly, or a question from the chat. So, uh, Rachel P says, I was very pleased to see your statistical style guide, and we have used it, and they're, uh, they're not a journalist, but they're within a government department. Oh, cool. Oh, um, I... And they want to know what sort of feedback have you had from journalists on it? Because obviously you talked about the BBC person that you spoke to, but what other, have you had a chance to speak to other journalists about it in detail? Um, I think bro I think I've, I've had people say, "Oh, that sounds like a good idea," and then do nothing about it. Um, but I, yeah, so I, I think I think the, the 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 feedback from the three or four journalists I've spoken to about it has been broadly, "This seems like a good idea." Um, the only explicit comments have been from the BBC guy saying nine out of these eleven are a good idea. Two of them, we think you're putting too much weight on your audience, uh, you know, on the readers, mm -hmm. and you should, as the journalist, be the one saying, "Don't trust this study because the sample size is small." or be you know be aware that this central point estimate is uh, is just a point a point estimate and that, that it could spread out yeah you know, rather than expecting the reader to do the work but yeah I think broadly positive while also not really paying that much attention to us you know um, <laughs> I think there's I have two things on that the first one is that one of the most lovely reviews of the book we had was I gave it to um, Durham University to do a oh, yeah, uh, fantastic uh, sort of publication for their you know student journalism basically. And the student picked it up and did a lovely review and saying, look, I, I have no idea about this sort of thing, but I, I am going into this sort of wide-eyed journalist saying, um, you know, I didn't think I was important, but I think it is important. I don't want to be, you know, making people, or misleading people. And so something that we're really happy about and what we we'll hopefully do in the future is talk to more journalists. I don't think that many people realize they're misleading people by, by doing these stats thing. And the second comment I was make, um, if you could email me, then that'd be great because I could have a nice impact report for uh, yeah. something. So <laughs> that'd be really lovely. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Rachel. Let's take a question from the hall. So um, the slide you showed with the suicide statistics, um, I'm not sure if I saw that exact thing a few years ago, but I saw something very close where it was clearly misrepresenting the trend. Hmm. Um, and a friend of mine had, had posted on Facebook or something, and she works with Samaritans, so of course she felt very strongly about it. And something I encounter not just with that piece of work, but a lot, is people saying, well, it's not whether this particular thing is correct that matters, it's the point. It's raising awareness of the issue. And I, I like that you, so close to that point, you also said that journalists are not bad people. Hmm. Um, so fundamentally, how do you fight the people who are trying to do good um, and misrepresenting statistics to do so in full willingness to help the world? It's really complicated because I, I get that a lot as well. I've, I have a few times, like, it happens to me all the time, like some statistic that gets shared or something, you know, like uh, this... That, that is shared, I don't know, you know, I don't want to talk about sides and so on, but by, some, by making some point politically that I broadly agree with, but is in itself wrong, right, and, for, um, and misleading. And I think, like, and, and you say, well, th this is not true, and then people assume that you are somehow on the other side of this great debate, and you are fighting against, you know, and it's these awful terms like fighting, but there is this sort of instant assumption that because you are pointing, you know, you're... You're, you're attacking the, the arguments made by one side or the other the, you're on the other side. And I, I think that, firstly, that's a really unhelpful way of looking at the world, that there's these sort of, you know, we, we should be trying to find out what is true, first and foremost. But also, I have this really heartfelt belief that if something is really bad, or if something, you know, if, if you know, I, I, I was, I, it's not a statistic, but I was thinking of people talking about Michael Gove saying we're, you know, um, uh, we're bored of experts. We, we, we know we've. Um, what's, what's the phrase? We've uh, had enough of experts. And he, it was. It's actually not really what he said. He had, we had, we've had enough of experts with from places with uh, um, 
it, acronyms who are telling the British public whatever. So he wasn't quite saying I've had enough of experts. And, I've, and people are saying, well, it doesn't matter. Michael Gove is, you know, uh, he's not trustworthy in these ways. And he's, uh, so he's just he's making the point that he's not. Okay, well, fair enough. If that's true, then find an example that is really him being untrustworthy rather, you know, and if he's as bad as you say, then you will find one easily. And if these situations of suicide are as bad as you say, then you will find examples that are truthful mm. rather than using one that is false, which, you know, just tactically speaking is a bad idea because then people, you know, pedants like me will come in and say, well, this isn't true, is it? And it undermines your point. So I think it's really, well, I, I hope that both your incentives of being truth-seeking and being an activist line up together because you want to give a truthful picture of the world which no one can undermine and then also if the the problem you are trying to solve in the world is bad enough there'll be plenty of examples of it without having to find one that is false and can then be shot down by people on the other side of whatever it is you're talking about i think that's my my position anyway thank you for your question we've just had a couple of a couple of comments come in on the uh, chat so uh, going back to the the style guide um one comment says that it shouldn't just be limited to journalists so you should roll it out to marketing and communications departments in industry as well so there's an expansion fine opportunity by us there. Yep. um and matthew carl in britain says have you considered character limited platforms such as twitter in the statistical uh, guidelines and do you have any specific suggestions for tackling a lack of caveats and context in sort of short form journalism god it's such a bugger isn't it do you want to, do you want to, do you want to take that oh, that's a hard one um i think part of the reason i think originally rather than the style guide we were going to sort of you know have something a bit more concrete like you have to do this kind of thing but then obviously there's a big issue with you know freedom of speech and everything what you can and mm. can't say and what we wanted i think then i think you maybe said came up with like a style guide is sort of a mm. suggestion so we don't want to be too um, prescriptive. Yeah, prescriptive about people. We want people to do it because they think it's the right thing to do. And then we hope, you know, like vaccinations or whatever, we hope people do it because that's the right thing to do and everyone agrees. I think that's a much better way of getting people on board with it because I think when you enforce something, then yeah. people don't know why they're doing it and it's sort of... It's, it and and as, as far as Twitter yeah. goes, I... I Yes, I think I think these guidelines would be very useful for people on Twitter. And I think they'll be. I think that broadly speaking, you know, the, the the person who's saying not just you know for, for marketing and everything will be very very useful as well. I think this is true. This is not like some journalist specific thing. Trying to be accurate and give context and admitting when you're wrong and things are all useful ideas for everyone. Um, the reason we focus on journalism is because there is a, a relatively small number of institutions which can adopt this thing. I mean, you, you know. It would be brilliant if literally everybody in, in, or all 15 million British Twitter users unilaterally adopted it or have 500 million around the world or whatever said, yes, I will do this. But there's not like a, a, a union of Twitter users which we can sort of appeal to to say, let's make this policy. Whereas there is, or, you know, there are journalism unions, there are, there's the um, various quite large, you know, if the BBC did it, then it would be, yeah. suddenly that would dominate the British, British uh, journalism market. So you can focus your focus the attention on these smaller on these sort of umbrella groups rather than saying hey everyone try and behave nicely and be good to each other and you know be excellent to one another and all that um so yeah so that so that, that's why we're focusing on journalism but yes i completely agree it is a it will be quite a useful thing for everyone to think about at all times excellent let's take another question in in the hall please uh jane hutton university of the warwick first of all thank you not only for the talk but for all the work you're doing which is very important thank you um and i think i'm not sure this is going to turn to question I very much like the idea of using detectable instead of significant. Um, I'm involved in a big legal case at the moment, and a lot of it issues around p-hacking. Mm. Um, so I think, I think perhaps the society ought to consider whether it isn't time to change that, because detectable does force people to think about what are you trying to find mm. without talking about null hypotheses. Um, and in terms of the, the style guide, um, what you're talking about is very similar to what the Royal Society not Royal Society Stats, the Royal Society, had indeed published about 20 years ago. Scooped again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you might also, um, for some purposes, find the Equator Network useful. Oh, thank so you. So if we can, again, thank you. And I think as a society, if we could have a serious discussion, we all know that significant has become a bit of a... Problem. Uh, yes, uh, a, a stone round our neck. 
Thanks. Mm. No, thank you very much. That's, you know, I'll look into the Royal Society things. I, I don't know if I have anything particularly to respond to that, other than that sounds like a really good idea. Um, you got anything to add? No, excellent idea. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's take another question, please. So, hi, Tom. Uh, so, Jen Rogers, fast Oh, hi, Jen. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> good, you? Yeah, very we'll well, chat thanks. over lunch. Um, so I think it was really, uh, I think it's a point that's sort of kind of been made by you and, and by one of the other questions, in that I think... Um, the point that you made about journalists typically mm. having to write a lot of articles and having to rely on a press release, mm. and then, you know, all us as academics doing our work, I think we forget there is that interim step where we've got our articles published, mm. then it turns into a newspaper article. Mm. There is the press release between, yeah. and I think there is an awful lot that we could be doing more with press officers and communications within all of our institutions. Because if you think about what their job is, it is to sensationalize so that it gets put into the national press. You know, mm. that, that is the whole point of them trying to get the research out there. And I think um, those individuals are probably people who we should be targeting rather than maybe being so harsh on journalists, which I know we're probably all guilty <laughs> of in this room. Yeah. Um, but I think that there is that interim step that that is really important and, and needs proper thought. And that yeah. guide, I think, is probably really useful for press releases um, as well as anything else. That's very true. Um, and you're right. There was a marvellous... I'm sure you read it. The, um, there was that marvellous research by, I think, Chris Chambers at Cardiff, which showed that there are things you could do with press releases. If you put at the top, this is, this is what this study does not say. So if you, if you do a study on two sort of, um, uh, I think it was, you know, brain training games and brain health or whatever, you, what you could put at the top, this does not show that brain training games prevent Alzheimer's and things like that. Just to sort of, just to sort of say, like, that I know you'll be tempted to interpret it this way, but that's not what... So, the, for example, this does not... The, this e-reading thing does not mean that screens are killing you would have been quite a good thing to put at the top of that. Um, and uh, that... And that his study showed, and I, I really hope that it, was, that it would replicate, because obviously that's uh, an issue, but uh, the, his study showed that the, um, doing that reduced the amount of misleading information in press releases and, and, in store, and in newspaper stories, but also didn't reduce the number, amount of coverage of the, of the papers. So that, you know, that is a, a really useful thing. And I will also say one thing in defence of press officers, because there was a, in the Lancet a couple of years ago, I think it was that pa paper we were talking about, the... Um, uh, older fathers and risk of seizures and things. I think it was that paper, and that got, and that that was in the Lancet. And the Lancet's um, and the, the reason I don't really blame the Telegraph for that paper is because they, they pay, the paper itself didn't contain any absolute risks, or at least they were hidden away in some uh, table, really in the midst of it all, where no one could find it. And the press officers who were heroes went in and got the data and found the uh, absolute risks and put that into the press releases. So they were doing the job that the scientists should have done. And, uh, and, and absolutely, yes, this is, it's a really important abs uh, intermediary step. And I think this sort of style guide or something like it would be really useful for them. But I do occasionally remember that, that I always remember that story as an example of press officers doing the work that the, the scientists really should have done. And it should be a sort of three-way interaction between scientist, press officer, and journalist. And they all have responsibility to make sure that this, this story gets out in a not misleading way. Mm. Sticking with uh, press officers and press releases, uh, Deirdre Toa on the chat asks, what do you think of the usefulness of the uh, before the headlines scheme run by the Science Media Center? Uh, yes. Uh, they, so, the, well, the, generally speaking, I find the Science Media Centre really, really useful. Um, they do uh, brilliant things. Of just, again, something that I found. <laughs> I remember speaking to a journalist from a different publication to me when, after we'd just come out of a briefing by the um, uh, Science Media Centre, and he was like, "But they've just ruined the story." You know, it's like, like, well, like what, what am I supposed to write about now? Like, it's just, they just, it's just undermined all the sort of... Well, well yes, that's the point. It, 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 what they've told you is there is not a story here that you cannot, you cannot put air pollution is killing 15,000 kids a day or whatever because it's not true. And that, or at least it's more complicated than that. So you, 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 they have chopped your legs away from underneath you and made it impossible to write the misleading story you were going to write. And that is a good thing. Um, so, yeah, so I think they, they, do a, they do a really useful service. There is slightly... I sometimes slightly worry that they have become the way that science, the science stories in the media are chosen now because the, you know, if, you are, if you are a journalist with not that much time to cover various stories and the Science Media Centre conveniently presents you with a set of brilliant quotes from five scientists on, the talk, on a story, then you'll go, well, I'll cover that story because that's nice and straightforward and my work's done. Um, and it means that 
there's less of sort of the journalists are doing less looking around and find, using their own judgment to find the stories that are done. And I think that has the potential to be a problem and is worth being aware of. But broadly speaking, the Science Media Centre is a really useful thing and their behind the headlines thing stops you from... Wait a minute, behind the headlines is the NHS, isn't it? I'm not sure if I'm getting... Uh, <laughs> I think, but yeah, anyway, the, 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 the thing that... Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, sorry. That's so someone from the audience says a summary briefing of the stats behind the thing. So, yes, and I find the work they do is extremely useful. And I hope I've sort of answered the question there. That's great. Well, we've got one time for one more question from the hall. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Luisa from University of Leeds, and I, I would like to uh, raise a serious um, point. Uh, I think the solution could be to use base factors. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, well, that's all the time we've got for this session. Carrie, did you want no, to sorry, expand you want on to that? Or, uh, it's fine. This would no, 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 no. But this is a serious debate about, yeah. about this, but I didn't want to get into the, sort of the technical debate. Yeah, we get, we get shouted at. Yeah, we get shouted at, basically. <laughs> but yes. Uh, I, I instinctively agree while also not really being con- technically proficient enough to know what I'm talking about. But yes, I, I, it seems to make intuitive sense to me uh, that you start with some prior belief of how likely something yeah, is and work from there. But that's probably a total misunderstanding of the whole situation, isn't it? I, let's not get into it. <laughs> okay, okay. We sort of agree, but we're not going to dare say it out loud. Uh, <laughs> well, hopefully uh, Tom and Dave will be able to stick around for lunch and answer some of your questions and consider some, some of your ideas. But I'd just like to say thank you all for coming. Thank you for tuning in on the live stream. And thanks to Tom and Dave for a really, really inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you.